so much for inviting me, Piero and Tom Tammy. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk to you about newer work um, that I've been doing, um, looking at feminist art in the Middle East. And my topic is really, what does it mean to be a woman in or from the Middle East? What links women in this region as they're negotiating categories like gender, nationality, religion? And I'll start by introducing you to this woman, Anissa Ashkar, a body and performance artist who I met a couple of summers ago um, in Israel. And she uses her face and body as her canvas. Um, every day she writes a new word in Arabic on her face. Um, she was born in Accra, Israel, to a Palestinian family. And the family um, all have Israeli citizenship. And her family um, experience has really caused her to probe her identity through this conversation starter. Um, so I met her and she had you know, a word on her face and you know, we, we would discuss um, what the word meant. So this idea of her, her face and her body as a canvas, um, dealing with different languages um, and dealing with different types of exhibition spaces, so kind of getting out of the canonical museums. Um, so how does work like this challenge us to think differently about stereotypes that we as Westerners often <coughs> associate with women who are defined as Arab, Muslim, Persian, Bedouin, Orthodox Jewish, um, so many different identities in this region. Um, we have a museum here in town. It's an online museum, the International Museum of Women, imao.org. And they just launched a very successful exhibit called Muslima, um, all about what it means to be a Muslim woman. Um, and they have global artists um, uploading art and, and content. So really opening up the dialogue and moving beyond um, stereotypes. And given the conditions of war and patriarchy that are so prominent in this region, I think it's really important to look at the common ground that women often share in their work and women dealing with religious fundamentalism, different religions, different countries, um, division between the sexes, but also pride in their religion. Um, so how do we balance um, all these different views and find um, common ground? Shireen Nashat is probably the best known artist, um, uh, feminist artist from the Middle East and um, really has been exploring for decades what it means to live in a region that is war-torn and misogyny is institutionalized. Um, born in Iran, um, she clearly influenced Ashkar, um, although here in her photograph she applies the Farsi calligraphy after the photo, uh, you know, directly onto the photograph, so it's not on her skin, as we saw with the other artists. And this is her most famous series. This is called Women of Allah. Um, and she did this, so sh she um, came to the US in the early 70s, and then did not, <coughs> excuse me, return to Iran until um, uh, 19, I'm sorry, after the revolution. And so she was so impacted by the stark changes um, in, you know, religious fundamentalism at that time. And so she started developing <coughs> these photographs back in New York around the subject of female warriors during the Iranian Islamic Revolution. And so, again, moving beyond the stereotype, the woman in the burqa who's the victim, she's this empowered woman with a long barrel rifle dividing her face. The Farsi um, calligraphy is actually poetry of contemporary Iranian women, this, in this case, Tahara Safar, Safarzadeh, um, a poet who works, um, who writes about relations between women, martyrdom, and political um, devotion. So she's really engaging the text along with this very strong, powerful image. She works a lot in video and um, since 9-11, her work um, has taken on an added charge with um, issues around Islamophobia in her country. So personally, I really like the way she combines this rich history of Persia and Persian thought and literature and history and beauty with more American ideals, um, social equality, justice, free speech um, that are um, prevalent in this country. So she's getting us to kind of think about similarities in human experience. 
Um, Nashat's work was featured in a 2003 exhibition that actually was conceived of before 9-11, but then became embroiled in the um, political aftermath of Islamophobia. Um, and this generated in England, Walsall in England, here, veil, veiling representation in contemporary art, and um, was censored. And particularly this piece, um, New Liberty, was framed as kind of visualizing all of the West's fears about Islam. Um, and clearly the artists, this is a Russian collective, wanted to amuse us and you know, get us to kind of raise questions and, and you know, think about these issues in a more critical way. Um, but it was perceived of as you know, very threatening and, and was censored. Um, so Nishat has influenced a whole generation of younger women, some of whom I'll show you their work um, this evening. Um, here is another Iranian woman, um, Nusha Tabakulian, born in 1981. And this is her Listen series that was exhibited at the Dubai Art Fair last year. And she's a self-taught photographer, um, began her career as a photojournalist at age 16, and started publishing <coughs> National Geographic, Le Monde, um, New York Times, Newsweek, and so on. Um, she just had an exhibit at the LA County Museum of Art, and she um, published an award-winning photo essay in 2006 called Women in the Access of, in the Access of Evil, kind of responding. Um, again, to the media's narrow depiction of Iranian women um, in the Shador and Hedzbar. Um So here, she has empowered this woman by putting boxing gloves on her. And this is a whole series that was exhibited together. And the, <coughs> the images of the women, they're all engaged in activities that are forbidden for them in their country. So attending a sports event, forbidden for women um, in Iran. Singing, singing in public. Um, and Shireen Nishat has videos about this as well. Um, so she's confronting and subverting um, the powerlessness um, based on gender-based um, restrictions. This is a more humorous piece. Um, this artist is named Nadia Kabilinki, born in Tunisia in 1978. And this is part of an exhibit also from Dubai around the um, time of the art fair last year called Black is the New White. And this is a light box, and she's playing with the role of advertising and how clothes um, become such a marker of identity. So she's saying, what happens if we create this imaginary line of Gulf Arab male dress, and men have to wear the thick, heavy, black polyester um, type fabrics, and women you know, get the lighter cotton, um, more friendly materials for the heat of the region. Um, so I think you know having humor is really important here. And she creates um, this imaginary brand, Joseph Van Helt. And um, Joseph, or Yusuf, from both the Bible and the Quran, was um, a man of exceptional beauty. And so he becomes this metaphor. He was apparently wrongly accused um, for refusing the advances of women and imprisoned. So she chose the name Joseph very strategically here um, with the block of Baya um, as you know, what confines him. This is an artist named Bushra <laughs> Almatuwako. Al and she was born in 1969 in Sana'a, Yemen, and um, lives and works there today. Um, and she is also um, engaging with the dress of the Muslim women. This is part of a larger series on the hijab. Um, this is called Mother Daughter Doll. And she portrays herself here, which is quite a feat for you know, a religious woman living <coughs> and exhibiting in this country, along with her daughter. And if you follow the series, they're exhibited nine together. So she completely, um, they, the figures completely disappear as they become progressively um, covered with the burqa. Um, so it's very self-explanatory, this kind of effacement of women and girls um, from society. And you can imagine the guts it took um, this woman. You can watch a TEDx talk um, that she gives about how she came to produce this work. And um, the risk that she took, she was afraid she would receive threats. 
Um, you know, where such an artist is exhibiting is obviously very important. There are alternative spaces um, in Yemen. She's, she created one, uh, Women's Collective. Um, and so she's really, you know, a practicing, you know, very a religious woman who is confronting fundamentalism um, in, in quite interesting ways. And uh, one person at the Dubai Art Fair saw this and said to her husband, this is Arab Spring, what your wife is doing here. Um, along the same um, series, she is um, kind of taking on male dress here and how there are similarities between male and female dress and the sort of long <coughs> flowing robes. Um, and loose kind of masculine clothing. So looking at different ways that the hijab functions in society and not being critical all the time and saying it can be beautiful, it can be decorative. Um, it's you know, an important part of women's modesty um, and, and pride and in some cases power. Um, so she's, she's quite an interesting person to watch. She's um, making work for the UN. Um, the British Council, very prolific. Um, Yemen named her the first Yemeni photographer, so she's got quite a, a stature. She was trained in the US, which I think part of um, her experience informs her experience. She went to George Washington University and studied business, and then took up photography on her own and got into photojournalism on that campus. Um, so really kind of developed a, a desire to engage in this type of work back home. And she couldn't find women to model for her. I mean, as a Muslim woman, you know, you, it, she realized she had to turn to herself. And she was most afraid of her, her family really um, having issues with this, which her mother <laughs> did. Um, this is the work of Andy Arnovitz, an Israeli artist born in the US, dual citizen. Um, and this is called 504 Years Later. Um, and here, she's coming from an Orthodox Jewish perspective, a, a religious artist. And she's also looking <coughs> at the burqa, which um, is used in the Karen Burya sect in Beit Shemesh in Israel. And so she's turning to Albrecht Durer's 16th century masterpiece here, this Adam and Eve diptych as her departure point and saying, hey, maybe they were actually more comfortable with sexuality than we are today. And this is problematic. Um, and you can see she does a lot of um, work with kind of stitching and overlays. Um, the work that she does that, that really um, touches me the most is um, her, her work on the Agunot series. So Agunot in Hebrew means chained woman. And these are women who are unable to get a divorce. Um, so they're orthodox women who are um, in marriages that they wish to leave and they cannot, they need to physically have written permission to get the divorce, it's called the get. And so um, when you're married in Israel, you receive an actual contract called a ketubah, a written contract. So what she did was she went to the National um, Archive and researched these beautiful ketubot and um, photocopied them, cut them up, which also, you know, as a religious woman, that's really interesting that she's cutting up these religious documents, and then hand sew them together. <coughs> and I'll show you a detail, it's really gorgeous. Um, so she talks about this piece as um, literally a straight jacket where women are trapped by the paper. And the irony that her get, her out, is another piece of paper. So the dual symbolism here of paper, she's left hanging, like these hanging threads. And she researched and photocopied hundreds of these um, documents. And many of her work, you know, celebrate um, traditions that she finds beautiful within her culture. So it's not all critical, um, but I'm showing you a selection this evening. This is the work of Rania Matar, who's based in Boston and was born in Lebanon and grew up um, during the Civil War um, in Lebanon, moved to the US in 1984. And here she is documenting um, t the lives of teenage girls in the US and the Middle East and kind of looking at how similar, how much we share, you know, that we kind of objectify the Middle Eastern Muslim girl 
And so she gets permission to go into the bedrooms of these girls. They're, they're asked to pose however they wish. And you might think we're in Newton, Massachusetts here, but we're not. We're in uh, Rabia, Lebanon, and this girl has dyed her hair, and she's got Marilyn Monroe, and she's got um, Crocs that she wears, and you know, this is globalization, right? This girl could be, you know, anywhere in the world. Um, so I, I love this series and the and this, the way this artist um, is working. And, and here is the Brookline girl, Sienna, and you can see, you know, just what similar things teenage girls. I have a teenage girl. I mean, that they think about, you know, pop culture and romance and you know the, the similarity of experiences that needs to be the subject here rather than the conflict. Um, she also does work in some of the Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon. And here, the room does look different. This is a two-room house, um, two-room structure where you know, many family members share this space. And this is Mariam. Um, you can see she wrote her name on the wall there, the way teenage girls might mark a place as a room of her own. She has her prayer mat there, and you know, items that are precious to her. So while it looks different from the other two, um, there is this shared experience. Um, and the artist, Matar, has run photography workshops for these girls in the refugee camp, so getting them to become photographers themselves. And this is my last image. Um, this is from an online journal that's fairly new called Gulfography. This is from last year. Um, and this came out of an exhibition of, um, from a women's college um, in the Gulf states. And um, women artists who are, again, you know, taking on um, the ambiguity of their experiences. What does it mean to hold a camera? Um, you know, who, who really possesses the gaze here? Um, and so the, the um, Emirati, Emirati women from Dubai and this whole region, they're in a situation where these cities are just burgeoning like crazy. The museums, they're huge museums. There's massive amounts of wealth. And they're having to negotiate. This is the first exhibit these women have ever had. And I think it, it'll be really interesting to watch as the art world shifts and this region becomes more and more um, central. The, the biggest art buyer um, in the world right now is a shake up from this region who's purchasing art for these museums. Um, so will work like this be on display in the museums of um, Dubai and Qatar? Um, or will it you know, rest in the art fairs on, on the outside? I think that's a discussion that is worth having. Um, so in conclusion, we've seen a wide range of work by female artists who really humanize and complicate um, what it means um, to kind of rely on these binaries of East and West, us and them, traditional, modern. Um, and they're really asking us to reconsider media stereotypes, um, particularly of Middle, Middle Eastern women as powerless victims, and kind of look at how um, being an artist is really a way to negotiate common ground. Um, and what I personally like to see, where, where I'd like to go with my work on this region, is looking at interfaith dialogue, um, which I think is really interesting, and how women's art <coughs> provides the public with this critical lens for sharing um, universal themes, just as in the, the girls' bedroom, but on um, religious grounds, I think is an interesting um, question. So thank you so much, and I look forward to your questions. Any questions? <laughs> yes. Uh, Paul, are you planning an exhibition? Or why not, if you are? <laughs> um, eventually, yeah. I mean, it's kind of an early stage of, of the project, but I, I feel like there's so much work to be done um, on this topic. There have been some really fabulous exhibitions within the last year. So at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, um, one exhibit just closed this week called She Who Tells a Story. And a few of these photographers I was able to see there. And that curator um, uh, was working in the Middle East and um, you know, working with many of the artists. 
And then I, I gave a, a lecture at Rutgers last year. They had a joint exhibit, Rutgers and Princeton, called the Fertile Crescent. And they really kind of took over the state of New Jersey. This is a, a Piero-type <laughs> collaborative enterprise with many universities involved. And um, there were exhibits in the, in the libraries, in the galleries, lectures. Um, so yeah, I would love to do something here in the Bay Area. I, I don't have a concrete plan as of yet. Yes? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm interested in that dress that had all the documents uh, mm -hmm. sewn up. Uh, I'm interested in the documents. Were the, was that a random uh, 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 <coughs> collection of those uh, documents? Because they're so, they're so decorative. Yeah, is there and, a way to you know, Most of the documents that I get aren't that decorative. Of the ketubah? They're really beautiful. They, yeah, they can be really decorative. I mean, here in the States, they're commissioned all the time. And you can say, you know, I'm into these symbols. Um, but yeah, they're, they were quite colorful, you know, back in you know the 16th century. I mean, if you look in Jewish museums, you can see this kind of color and richness. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And, and then, but there's also legal writing on them. Is that right? Is yes. That right? Yeah. Cool. And it's, you know, it's very much the woman is the property of, um, you know, the traditional ketubah. Um, mm -hmm. And so if you're married in Israel, uh, many young people now who are not religious won't get married in Israel. Like young Israelis, they'll go to Greece for the, the week. Because if you're married in Israel, then you're faced with this divorce situation. You know, you can only go through um, the rabbinate, through the Orthodox um, control um, to, to break the contract. So, Hannah, do you want to say anything about <laughs> divorce? No, from your... Those who want to get divorced, get divorced. Yeah. You get the good lawyer. I was married to a, I was married to a Jewish woman for a long time. But I didn't get a document like that. It's very optional in the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 they have secular people. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I have sort. It seems that most of the people you presented lived here, moved here in you know, some way, and of uh, the ones who perhaps even the Iranian woman did. And my my guess from outside would be that Iran would be produce more art than other Middle Eastern countries. But I'm curious, have you looked at all at artists who have remained in that area? Are there any? Is it possible for women to produce Yes, yeah, so the, um, the Bushra woman, the Yemeni woman, is living and working there. She did study in the US, um, but she went back and um, is really committed to um, change and human rights in that region. The first artist, the Palestinian artist, um, lives there. So, um, yeah, I mean, many of them have moved here. It's obviously easier for them as artists to work and exhibit their work. But there's a whole exciting dialogue. Um, you know, if I had more time, I'd show you more examples of artists who are there. So. Is, first. Uh, is there an ethnicity component also? If you take some place like Lebanon, you have Armenians, <coughs> Arabs, uh, Iran, you've got just a whole mishmash of Armenians and Kurds. And Absolutely, and, and one could go deeper into that. Um, my own sort of, I mean, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm a Middle East expert. I was trained in European art and kind of moved into this more recently, but I've spent time in Israel, and I can say within that tiny country, you have so many different religions and, and backgrounds and so to work in this area you really need to you know be well versed in um, in how the the ethnic identity inflects the work as well so again if I had more time I would go deeper into that thanks uh, yeah I have two quick questions if I could thank you for showing such beautiful work on the way I, I wanted to ask uh, is this work really being exhibited or is it really just being exhibited in the West, or which countries is it really being shown in? And, and also, um, I couldn't help but think of uh, the Guerrilla Girls mm -hmm. in, like, in the West and how the strategy there has been to sort of hide their identity. But here it's very much the identity of, of the artists coming forward. Mm -hmm. And I, I, was, I was curious, do, 
to, to ask, do you think that strategy would work in, in the sort of Eastern context? Is that being used, or is it really always about the person, the person making those risks and having to be behind that whole story? Yeah, interesting question. So the first question, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, that was a lot there. But, but, but it, it, where is it being exhibited? Yeah. So um, there's a lot being exhibited in, du at, in Dubai. So I showed you a lot from the 2012 Dubai Art Fair. Okay. Um, so you know, with the um, United Arab Emirates and um, the explosion of the art market, there is a lot of opportunity in that um, part of the world. But the yeah. Yemeni artist is exhibiting in, in galleries and public spaces in Yemen. Uh, again, it's, it's harder um, to negotiate depending on um, politics of the institution. Um, and then in Israel, the, um, this artist was part of an exhibit of religious orthodox women artists who were all making work that was critical of gender issues and, and celebrating parts of their religion as well. And so the reactions were mixed. You know, There were definitely a lot of critics in the paper that I read who were really unhappy. And um, there's a direction in that country that um, you know, wants nothing of this. Um, in terms of masking identity, um, it's, an, it's a really interesting question. I, I can't think of someone that's doing that, um, and I don't know how it would go over. And um, Yeah, I, I have to think about that. It's, it's like having the HR there wouldn't work. Right. right? So just kind of, yeah. yeah. No, thank you. Okay, one last question. Does Rania Matar's work I think I found her, again, thank you for showing the works because you introduced a few artists I had never heard of before. But with her, I'm going to start with I find I'm probably the most problematic is because she's basing, she's basing, I almost feel like she's photographing these women, but then they're still kind of, they're still going by these tropes of Americanism almost. You know, like, let's show these Muslim girls but then they have GQ magazines all over, like plastered all over their wall. So I'm mm -hmm. wondering if her work, because for me that's problematic. Because if she wants to say, oh, look at these girls, they're normal. Well, that's, you know, it's almost like they're normal as, as in comparison to American girls. So I'm wondering if her work has the opposite. You showed a third picture. Mm -hmm. But that is not necessarily like, say, you know, a young woman here in the U.S. So mm -hmm. I'm curious if she has works that are the reverse, where it shows Muslim women or mus young Muslim girls or women or teenagers in the U.S. that are similar to the Middle East, mm -hmm. where they, they're living this type of life mm -hmm. that's um, similar to what people would say is stereotypical over there. Yeah, I mean, this particular series are girls in their bedroom, and I didn't see any American um, I didn't see an example of what you're describing, which is really interesting. There is another series called Femme en Fond of these younger girls. They're like um, 10, 11, 12, and it's, there's less going on behind them. And it's really just like that awkwardness of puberty. Like, and she told them, the only, you can pose however you want, you just can't smile. And so there's this defiance, and, um, and the, you know, the girls are from all different backgrounds. So you should look on her website. Um, but I think there's some really interesting dialogues that, that are going on there. Just a quick comment, Carol. Uh, there's a lot of work being shown in countries like Iran, but it's not in the public domain. It's shown by the these groups mm -hmm. because of the political dynamics. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.